We've talked about fixing the DB pension system, but what about fixing the rest of the UK? Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage a well-known, highly respected figure in British politics and the media, Daniel Finkelstein. Um, Daniel observed in his column in the Times last Saturday that the most useful feature on a smartphone, he was referring to those of a certain age uh, trying to read res uh, menus in a dimly lit restaurant, is the torch. Um, I'm confident that he won't need any artificial aids to illuminate for us what's been going on in UK politics and, and what lies ahead. So, Daniel, welcome to the conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I was a bit worried by that uh, gap between the two sessions because everyone started pouring out. It was a bit like when Paddy Ashton used to get up in the House of Commons. Um, so <clears throat> it's very nice to uh, be here and uh, to speak to you again. Um, <clears throat> I've been given uh, hilariously 20 minutes to define the fate of the nation. No problem whatsoever. Uh, I want to start with a thought experiment uh, with the idea that you are putting one hand in a bucket of cold water and one hand in a bucket of hot water and then you take both of them out and put them in a bucket of of lukewarm water. The hand that was in the hot water will feel cold and the hand that was in the cold water will feel hot. Now I'll give you a human example of this which is the contrast principle. A woman writes to her parents at universe, from university say, dear mum and dad, the concussion is wearing off now after the fire destroyed all of my belongings. But uh, I, I am pleased to say that the man in the petrol station across the road uh, took, me to, uh, took me to the uh, hospital after I jumped out of a first story window. Uh, he's a really lovely man and even though he's been married six times already, we've fallen in love uh, and we hope to get married and we intend to be married before the pregnancy shows. <laughs> and said, <clears throat> actually mum and dad, I'm not pregnant, I'm not going to get married, I didn't meet a man from the petrol station, I didn't jump out of the window, there wasn't a fire, I don't have concussion, but I did fail all my first year exams and I want you to get it into perspective. <laughs> Basically, politics works like that. It works by the contrast principle. It's not just how good you are, but how good your opponent is. You've all heard that, uh, the, that story about the two men who are being chased by a tiger, and one of them stops to put on training shoes, and his friend shouts out, you can't, what are you doing? You can't outrun a tiger. And he shouts back, I'm not trying to outrun the tiger. I just have to outrun you. Well... <laughs> Politics works like that, and you can define the contrast principle in British politics in two words, which are Jeremy and Corbyn. Um, when I'm trying to establish what's going to happen politically over the coming year, it's important to understand that the government, whatever its failings, gets seen uh, by contrast to its opponents. And this gives uh, Theresa May a huge uh, political advantage. But it's a huge political advantage, as I'm about to explain, that she's really going to need. One of my big rules of politics is what I call the Mandy Rice Davis principle. Mandy Rice Davis was appearing in court during the Profumo scandal and it, she was accused by the lawyer of having had an affair with Lord Astor. And, uh, then uh, during a cross-examination, uh, the barrister said, you know, Lord Astor denies he had an affair with you. And she replied, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Well, he would say that, wouldn't he, is a good description of most people's politics. I was in Westminster in Parliament Square, and there were a whole host of lorries going round, and they were all hooting their horns. And the man in my taxi said, uh, do you know what they're protesting against? And at first I said I didn't know, because I didn't know what their protest was. And then I said, actually, I think I do know. I think the reason they're protesting is they think you and I should give them some of our money and that it's in the public interest that we do so. Uh, the reason I knew that would be their position is because that is everybody's position on everything. Uh, <laughs> And we all laugh, but it's all of our position, uh, is our position, um, uh, certainly, you know, uh, my position. I spoke to a group of holiday camp providers and I, I said to them, you know, I'm against VAT on newspapers and you're against VAT on caravans. And they laughed at the bit about newspapers, dead silence during the bit about caravans. So we all, we all have that view. And I remember once... Um, in politics, uh, holding a big bucket out by the door, waiting for somebody to come and give charitable donations to a political cause, and along came Roy Jenkins, and he opened his uh, 
wallet, and in it were only foreign banknotes. Uh, Bamba Gascon had to lend him five pounds. Uh, and when I looked at it, I suddenly understood why it was that Roy Jenkins was much less bothered than me about politics going to international organisations, because obviously it would be something that he would be able to navigate more easily than other people. People's interests align very closely with what their politics are. And sometimes we forget that and we think, you know, really this issue is just a cultural issue, for example, and doesn't really affect anyone's economic interest. If you ever find yourself thinking that, you may just not be working hard enough to work out what someone's economic interest is. Let's take the issue of political correctness. Who would be politically correct? Well, let's say that you've got a large amount of human capital. You're very well educated. You're very well connected to global markets. You have real social prospects and real economic prospects. What's the one thing that could prevent you from having those uh, economic prospects? Well, you may not have uh, civic equality and you may be a member of a discriminated against group. So you find that women, for example, or members of ethnic minorities or gay people are, are when they're very educated, particularly strongly against political correctness. Now imagine who might be in favour of, uh, of, of opposing political correctness, who might uh, be the strongest people who take the stage and argue against it. Well, it's people with less social capital, uh, less educated, who belong to dominant social groups and whom a lack of civic equality are, is the one thing that prevents them from being competed against uh, in the workplace. In other words, old males uh, who are white living in crumbling seaside constituencies, UKIP. So, uh, you can, when you look at people's economic voting, but economic interests and their voting behaviour or their attitudes, they're very often closely aligned. And if you don't think they are, you may just not be working hard enough to get at the reasons uh, why they take that view. And so when you look at the Brexit referendum, I think uh, the best way of viewing it is not through ideas, but just to understanding that we are two countries, Romania and Libya. Romania are those people who are connected to the global markets, they have high uh, education, they have high expectations of what globalisation might produce for them, they're gainers from uh, a, a fast-moving capital market, they're confident about being able to manipulate international institutions, perhaps they speak more than one language or at least a smattering of it, they read the newspapers and they have some sort of understanding of what uh, economic global trends are and they have a reasonable degree of optimism about them. Levia is strongly correlated with those people who are not so highly educated, who don't, uh, for example, uh, feel optimistic about social trends, who are not connected to global markets in the same way. That isn't, of course, to say these things are 100% mapped. Nigel Lawson obviously lives in Romania and votes Levia, uh, but a Lot of the correlation is very strong. I was very interested to find out that the strongest correlation uh, to, um, to voting uh, leave is being obese. Uh, and I'm obese, but I voted remain. So it's not 100% uh, mapping, uh, but it is very much a relationship. And so when you're trying to understand politics, it's very important to understand demographic groups. The third rule of politics is that we're very loss averse. Uh, if I gave to everybody in this audience a mug or a cup at random and then I asked you to swap it, you'd be very reluctant to do that uh, because in the few moments after I gave it to you, you became attached to this useless object and you prefer yours to someone else's. If I sold you a ticket for the maximum price that you were willing to pay to go to the theatre um, and then I brought it back from you, an economist would say you would sell it to me at the same price uh, that, I, uh, that I sold it to you, plus a small nuisance fee. That's traditional economic thinking. In reality, that wouldn't happen. The moment after I sold you the ticket, you'd become attached to having it. And because you became attached to having it, you'd demand a much bigger price for it than you were willing to pay for it. Uh, and loss aversion is a very important part of people's political psychology. I'll give you an example of how that affects a political debate. In London, uh, there is a dispute about the trains. If I came uh, to you with this plan, I propose to make everyone queue up for their tickets in front of a little glass 
office. I'm going to take all the staff off the concourse and put them in these little rooms and you have to queue up for them. This is going to cost hundreds of millions of pounds and uh, because it costs hundreds of millions of pounds, I'm going to close the tube at night. You would look at me as though that was the most stupid plan you'd ever heard. Uh, and yet, when London Underground said what we'd like to do is close the ticket offices, uh, make the staff that are in the little glass offices go on the concourse, save hundreds of millions of pounds, and use the money to open the tube at night, everyone was against it because they were closing down the ticket offices. Because people are more strongly against things that they lose than they are in favour of the consequent gain. And this is a very important important uh, part of political debate and ignored by politicians, as I shall argue in a moment, at their peril. And then my fourth rule. You're walking down the road and ahead of you, you see someone who uh, is walking as well and suddenly they slip up. And you think to yourself, what an incredibly clumsy person. You go towards them to pick them up and you slip over yourself. Because what you hadn't appreciated where you were is that it wasn't that they were clumsy, it was that the path was slippery. We make this mistake, it's called the fundamental attribution error, all the time. We attribute to people what is actually a feature of their situation. Uh, so uh, this government um, is uh, assessed by looking at the people who are in it. Uh, is Theresa May different from David Cameron? Is Philip Hammond different from George Osborne? And those are important questions. But a more important question is how similar and how different is their position? Uh, obviously, the position that the government in is worse than the previous one because it has to cope with all the uncertainties of Brexit, but it is also similar to the previous one in that it has no money and it has no majority. And uh, we often ignore those thinking that it's an entirely new government, entirely new political situation, until you hear the Chancellor speak and you see that he's actually presenting a very similar type of budget in terms of figures uh, to, to George Osborne's, only slightly worse because the figures have um, declined after our, our decision to leave the European Union. So let's take those rules and see what they might mean uh, in political terms in the coming year. Uh, the first thing is, uh, I'm not a believer that there is such a thing as soft Brexit. If I'd believed that there was such a thing as soft Brexit, I might have voted to leave the European Union. Uh, I don't think it's going to be possible for us to be a member of the single market while we're at the same time leaving the European Union. It means that the rules for all domestic industries would be set by a body to which we're not a member. Even if they allowed us to be part of the single market when we want to change our rules on immigration, which they absolutely won't, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. And although the government has announced it, and that's been described as Tory Brexit, in reality it's just what Brexit is. Brexit is leaving uh, the European Union and not being a member of the single market. And I think that's been relatively clear, even if some of the people who advocated leaving didn't uh, see it. So we're going to have a debate about a deal, but primarily companies and organisations should concentrate on how to make Brexit as smooth as possible. The issues that it should be raising with government are less the ones about free trade, than they are about ensuring that the regulatory environment for all of their international trading and domestic trading remains stable and sensible and understandable in the changed institutional environment. Um, but at the same time as understanding that there isn't a, such a thing as a soft Brexit, also remember that people are loss averse. What's going to happen is that we're going to take back control and then find that nobody wants to change anything because every time you try to change anything, the gainers are smaller and feel it less intensely, intensely than the losers feel the loss. It'll be like the ticket offices. So what we're going to do is we're going to take back control and gradually re-implement all of the regulations that we left the European Union to avoid. Uh, and um, this is because we're loss averse uh, and because of my analysis of Brexit. Secondly, don't expect there to be an election. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about snap election. William Hague wrote an article saying he thought there'd be a snap election. He didn't base that on any briefing from the government. It was his own uh, thinking. But when people used to say to me, uh, David Cameron is uh, about to call an election after 2010 to get a bigger majority, I always used to say, well, that's funny because I've just been round to his flat and he's putting in a kitchen. The, the, truth is that <clears throat> the truth is that prime ministers are loss averse like anybody else. Theresa May has just become prime minister. She's got a majority, uh, albeit small, but it's workable. Uh, and you ought to translate uh, political events in almost the opposite way uh, to which most people are doing it. They're saying, you know, 
if the government wins by-elections, that makes a snap election more likely. That isn't correct. If the government starts to lose by-elections, then it might think it's going to lose its majority, and because there's a fixed-term Parliament Act, they'd begin to become worried about losing their majority and not having control uh, of Parliament and not being able to call an election. So before they get into that position, they might then decide to uh, call a general election. So if the government begins to lose by-elections, then begin to think, I wonder whether they're going to call a snap election. While they are winning by-elections, their majority remains. Remember that the Prime Minister is loss-averse like everybody else. The next thing, um, government will face difficulties not uh, just um, of the kind I talked about about elections, but in general on issues of loss aversion. And you can see the reaction to the changes on self-employment yesterday. Uh, our emotions, our, our, our brain are the sort of lawyers of our emotions. Uh, and therefore people will find all sorts of reasons to argue against the self-employment change that the Chancellor made yesterday. Uh, for example, you promised not to do that uh, in the general election. Strong arguments, uh, but arguments that basically come down to this. If you take away 5p from somebody, that person will be 5p cross. Uh, and uh, so will their allies. And uh, when the government has to do this, people are loss averse and they will be upset and annoyed and the government will have difficulty with them. This is because they're loss averse and because of the Mandy Rice Davis principle, because politics uh, is demographic. And the government doesn't have any money, so every time it does something, it's going to inflict loss aversion. I believe the government has lost its majority for austerity. George Osborne found that every time he made a welfare change. Philip Hammond, I think, will find that over uh, national insurance. I wouldn't be at all surprised to discover that he can't get these proposals, which require primary legislation, through uh, the Houses of Parliament. He doesn't have to go through the Lords, but through the Commons, that he'll have real difficulty without making amendments. And it doesn't matter that you can, uh, you can say rationally uh, it is consistent with the promise they made, or rationally that it makes sense to close the gap between self-employed people and employed people. If you do take money away from self-employed people, self-employed people will be really cross, people who represent self-employed people will be really cross, anyone who wants to get rid of you and thinks they can build a coalition with self-employed people will be really cross, and employed people won't be so cross, and that's just um, the way that politics works. Um, Finally, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, do I expect Jeremy Corbyn to survive? There is a market failure in coups. Uh, that, is, um, that is caused by the following dynamic. Uh, if you challenge the leisure of a party, you concentrate the costs on you. But the benefits go to everybody and you can't be certain that you will get an outsized amount of the benefits. So therefore the costs for an individual in challenging Jeremy Corbyn are greater than the benefits they can accrue. This produces an undersupply in political coups. Uh, so the Labour Party used, the Labour Party knew that it needed to get rid of Gordon Brown, but it couldn't find anybody, Alan Johnson, Jack Straw, David Miliband, willing to incur the real costs of challenging him. David Miliband knew that if he challenged him and lost, uh, it would reduce his chances of being leader in future, or at least he thought that. There are actually counter examples. He thought that would be the case, and uh, therefore he decided not to challenge him. Uh, if you were the, a credible future Prime Minister uh, and you think you can become leader of the Labour Party, the moment to challenge uh, uh, for the leadership of the Labour Party is when your chances of winning are high and the costs of campaigning for the leadership are low, and you may, you're unlikely to calculate that that's now. That moment may arrive. The forces that are allied against Jeremy Corbyn are becoming larger. Parties are risk averse, there is an undersupply in political coups, but people are not entirely detached from reality. It is impossible to win a general election if you are behind on leadership and you are behind on the economy. But Labour faces this prospect. The economy has been strong for a long time. If you combine that with Brexit, there is a reason to believe you could end up in 2019 with quite low growing income. And as I've said earlier, people's politics, the Mandy Rice Davis principle, is guided by that. They're not following every jot and comma of politics, but they know how they feel. So you can imagine them being in a situation where the economy doesn't favour the Conservatives. Now think about uh, whether you're ahead on leadership. Well, they're never going to be ahead on leadership with Jeremy Corbyn. It isn't, by the way, that uh, people think he's very left-wing. They don't know enough about him to do that. You know, his biggest asset at the moment is that he's so incompetent no one ever hears anything he says. Um, because if they did, he'd do worse. Um, but uh, 
and, 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 and I'm not just, this isn't just a joke. I mean, it, polling suggests that, that when you actually confront people with the things that he really thinks, they're completely horrified, but they don't know what those things are. Uh, so um, if the Labour Party were to go into the general election with Jeremy Corbyn, they'd be behind on economic competence and behind on leadership, pretty much whatever happens to the real economy. Uh, but um, if the Labour Party were to change, they might be in a position whereby they could wrestle the Tories to the floor, either get them to have another small majority or even to be in a parliament without a majority at all. That's, uh, that's a, a, a reality for them. You have to wonder whether even this undersupply of political coups that I'm suggesting would really uh, prevent them from um, moving in those situations. Uh, I think it, I certainly don't expect it to happen in the next 18 months, but beyond that, it could. So um, when you're trying to assess the uh, future of the nation, there's a lot of things to, uh, to discuss, but uh, I hope that this is just an introduction and that you will have some questions and if you've got issues that I haven't raised, you'll raise them. Thank you.